Well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, tonight we have a speaker for you um, for Peace Action Maine. We're happy to have Eric Erdstrom, who is a, a, a former captain in the U.S. Army with us. Um, he's written a, uh, a book called On American Soldiers Reckoning of the Longest uh, of Our Longest War. Um, has some very intimate uh, insights from his um, perspective in, in, in both entering and, and having his, uh, um, his perspective challenged and changed as he uh, served our country. Um, I've been impressed so far by reading it by and that it, it, it not only gives a window of a soldier, uh, but also, um, you know, different quotes over time and different people <laughs> who are probably watching, um, you know, um, the war from a distance and what that is like, um, uh, you know, how it affects a, a, a person who's serving the country over there, what his emotional situation was like. Um, um, uh, the other thing that's really important about this, I think, is that um, he's helping really to um, bridge something which Peace Action has been interested in for quite a while now, and that is the connection between the uh, militarism and the climate. And uh, that's just something which is, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a gaping hole in our consciousness. Um, in any case, he's, um, uh, we're happy to have him here tonight. Um, and uh, I guess I will let him uh, get uh, started. <laughs> um, so welcome, Eric. <laughs> thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you, Martha. And hello, Peace Action Maine. I feel like sort of the beginning of a, a rock show or something like that at a concert. <laughs> and, uh, it's really good to be sharing some time with you. And um, I'm really honored and, and grateful to have been asked and to hear that um, the things I wrote about over many years to put together a book caught the attention of some people from this group. And they thought enough of it to ask me to speak. So. It's one of the great joys of being an author to know that something you wrote touched people in a way that that matters, and um, it, it 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 brings me a lot of joy to to know that. And it's obviously an extremely tough topic. It's not the most lighthearted material. Uh, I don't think anyone says that by picking up *Un American* or *Passive Descent*, which is a another bu book published this year that I co-authored the first um, well. I, I authored the first chapter and I was one of about a dozen veterans to pitch in for that book. Uh, but, but these are tough conversations to have. And for many who are less familiar with uh, sort of the points of view that we provide, um, it's probably very confronting. And some folks uh, you know, are, are sharing anecdotes from their lives um, about some of the worst days that they've ever experienced. So maybe I'll just start out by sort of elaborating a bit more on some of this background of who's this person sitting here? What was my journey to sort of shift from military to studying climate science? And um, how have I tried to participate in, in putting a voice out there on this nexus or intersection between militarism and climate uh, specifically? So uh, as Stephen was mentioning, you know, I. I I went to West Point, but I grew up in Massachusetts, so not too far away from all of you, and certainly remember my childhood, uh, you know, uh, vacations of going up to Bar Harbor, Maine, or or Bangor, or um, was it Cadillac Mountain, I recall, climbing as a kid? Oh, Martha's given big thumbs up. Um, so, like, you know, certainly spent a, a decent amount of at least summertime as a child in Maine. And, um, you know, from the age of 17, I joined the military. It was, I graduated high school in 2003, which is about as um, jingoistic or nationalistic a time as you could be in terms of blind faith and nationalism in, in recent American history. And, uh, you know, at that age, I knew a few things. Number one, I knew I couldn't pay for college uh, and that my family didn't have money for me to uh, attend college on their dime. So I was gonna have to find my own way. Number two, uh, I sort of believe that military service is an absolute good. You know, you're raised as a child on a diet of stories that the US, no matter what they do, um, it, it's always a good thing to serve. 
Um, only later, as I learned, it's not true and that it's actually extremely patriotic to question that premise about military service being an absolute good. And one of the analogies that I often use that seems to resonate with folks is that no other public service career um, would have the same sort of effects in the sense that if you devoted your life to being a teacher and you became better at teaching, you could go to sleep fairly soundly knowing that the community and the kids you teach are probably better off. The same thing could be said about being a firefighter. If you're really good at being a firefighter, presumably, you know, things are, things are better for your, your community. But being in the military, because it is not about construction or risk prevention, it is about destruction. Um, it does not mean it's an absolute good uh, to be serving in the military because it highly depends on what the war is that you're gonna go fight. And one of the main things in American culture is to push out of view uh, any thoughts about what is the war that you're trying to fight, that you, you don't ask a lot of these questions that are upstream saying, why are we doing this? How does this actually uh, relate to defending Americans at home? What are gonna be the externalities on the people that are living there? Is this morally justified? Is it justified in terms of international law? Um, you know, what sort of precedent ethically and morally do we set as a country uh, and, and what sort of impairments to our own national reputation globally might we have by intervening in a conflict? So those are all things that I never really was thinking about when I was 17 and thinking about uh, joining the military. And, you know, aside from the two things I just mentioned, you know, three is I, I was athletic and really loved this idea of character building and personal development that you were not necessarily going to get taught formally as they do in a West Point curriculum at a civilian university. And so I, I applied and was very grateful to have gotten in. And uh, my, my path sort of continued down that same route, that once you get to West Point, uh, you start stacking yourself amongst your, your classmates. And the most American thing you can do, or the most, um, not, not the most sexy thing you can do, but like the, the best thing that you could possibly do for service for your country is to be as close to combat as possible. That it was almost seen as a scarlet letter or shirking your duty uh, to be picking a support role because you're in the back. The, the real Americans actually confront the enemies of America in close combat and fight them. And you don't see around West Point any buildings named after the supply and logistics officer. Uh, they are named after combatant commanders. Uh, no one in uh, Signal <laughs> is, is, is getting a statue or a, a time uh, article written about them. It is about combatant commanders moving armor and infantry and field artillery units and aviation assets. Uh, around the engagement area. So like it is culturally quite ingrained. And so for me as well, being the type A competitive person that I am, you know, pursued that route wholeheartedly. And I branched infantry. I went to ranger school and um, reconnaissance school. I attended and passed special forces selection when I was 19. And I saw this life coming uh, ahead of me of becoming one day, dreaming of being a detachment commander in the Green Berets and um, doing great work. And that's sort of what I saw. And in many ways, West Point's a bit insulated from that. Um, in terms of sort of pedagogy, you are being taught by an older version of yourself. Because the people who teach you are those that often graduated from West Point and lived a very siloed, channeled life where they did the same military training they did the same military schoolings, they did the same deployments, they go to the same graduate schools, and then they come back and recycle those same thoughts at the academy over and over again. Um, and, and so in, in many ways, one could say that that's in some ways brainwashing. Uh, and, and I had a very particular view of the world that was extremely positive about uh, the use of political violence in other countries and the belief that if I were guided by great values, 
I could do the right thing, that it doesn't matter what war you're in. If you as an individual are leading um, you know, on a moral compass that points to true north, that your service is good. And I believe that, uh, at least until I got to Afghanistan. And so my, my time proceeded where you know, I became a uh, platoon leader in Kandahar, Afghanistan, where about 25% of my platoon I originally deployed with became casualties during that year-long deployment. And they became casualties in lots of different ways. I did not make it through the first week of my tour in Kandahar before uh, a vehicle was hit by a uh, anti-personnel mine linked to homemade explosives. And it completely ripped apart my squad leader's vehicle, tossed the engine block um, you know, quite far away, tires going 100 meters away, and, and we're evacuating four of my soldiers before the outgoing unit had even left. And so, you think about it and you realize, okay, this is one week down and I've lost four guys that are now injured and out of the, the tour. I didn't know how seriously injured they were and whether they would be permanently handicapped, whether they would have traumatic brain injuries. Uh, and, and so I, I was unclear like what this year was gonna look like. If that's one week down, um, that is a pretty ominous view. And so, Throughout that deployment, I started to realize as the U.S. was shooting a school, not a school bus, but basically a passenger bus uh, full of machine gun rounds by the Arkansas National Guard because they were driving too close to the U.S. convoy and the presumably very frightened 19-year-old private or whoever is in the back of the convoy feels, feels threatened. Uh, and they shoot this bus up killing, you know, something like three or five people and injuring uh, double digits of others, uh, you could understand the legitimate grievances and anger that Afghans had for us being in their country. And I knew after a certain amount of time that no matter what I did as an individual, I was an occupier. And that the things that our country was doing to the people of Afghanistan uh, is unquestionably state terrorism. Because if you did the same thing to us, uh, if you had a drone strike hit a wedding in Maine, uh, what would you call it? By a foreign country or uh, maybe a, a, a group? Well, it would probably be considered terrorism. If they were targeting uh, you know, people in the CIA, the FBI, and, and the military, and maybe policymakers who were voting the wrong way that they didn't like, and, and they're being targeted for assassination either by drone or by uh, raids, we would probably call it terrorism. If Americans were being held in black sites for being tortured or held in a Guantanamo equivalent, um, we would probably call that terrorism. But we do that to other countries and we are willing to destroy far more for far less as a country. And so I started to realize that while I was there and it was a pretty rude awakening. and. Um, about nine months in, I uh, received my sort of email from uh, like basically the, the Special Forces branch in Fort Bragg, North Carolina saying, hey, your packet's been accepted. You've already gone through selection. When you finish this deployment, you'll report down back to uh, Fort Bragg. You'll no longer be classified as an infantry officer. And you, know, you can begin the rest of the Q course. And to me, this was the dream I had for many years. It, this was the culmination of uh, many years of hard work at West Point and chasing a dream that others thought was right and that I thought was right for, for quite a long time. And having seen what I, what I saw in, and witnessed in Afghanistan, it took me about 15 minutes to think about that and then respond quite curtly that this is something I'm no longer interested in and I'm looking to exit the military as soon as I possibly can when my contract is over. And so, you know, I, I left the military in 2012 as a captain um, after being in the Honor Guard in DC. And I thought about what I wanted to do next. And, you know, I had been 
during that sort of period of time, I think it came out in 2006 or something, 2005, An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. And it start, that was the first thing that got me thinking more seriously about what is this whole climate change thing? How serious is it? And, uh, you know, maybe I should devote some of my time, energy, and assets to learning more about this and having some sort of an impact. And uh, I went to graduate school in the UK and did an MBA and also a master of science where I studied climate change, specifically stranded assets, which are uh, things that you could think of that suffer from a premature write down or devaluation because the world doesn't understand climate change very well, at least certainly hasn't in the last several decades. Um, and basically like things that are at much greater risk than we may think or what would be popularly considered um, risky. And from, from that point, I uh, worked in the private sector in consulting and spent a lot of time thinking about my experience in Afghanistan. And I knew I wanted to write about it. And I knew that I wanted to have a climate lens in the book. The editors and, and the publishing house wasn't actually sure whether that was a good idea. And, um, you know, like, is this a book about a soldier's experience in war and sort of having a um, first person primary source perspective on what it is to be in combat? Or is this about policy and lots of other stuff? And I felt that I wanted to make a very conscious decision in writing that book that I didn't want to say that the war is um, wrong, uh, immoral, and uh, you know, a, a huge waste of our country's assets and devastating to the people of Afghanistan. Um, I also wanted to take a stand on, and say, and, and take a perspective on what we should be focusing on instead. And so I, I put a lens looking at uh, the climate crisis. And so I'll read just a, a couple paragraphs from that excerpt from the book. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the article that I penned with Colonel Larry Wilkerson and uh, retired Major General Dennis Leitch uh, earlier this spring. And so what I mean by uh, climate action as patriotism. So here it goes. Since the Industrial Revolution, the United States is the world's leading contributor to climate change, emitting more carbon dioxide than the next three countries combined, China, Russia, and Germany. This measure of total emissions, rather than only looking at present day emissions, is the measure to use when allocating culpability because gases like carbon dioxide do not dissipate for thousands of years. On the topic of climate change, the United States has de demonstrated willful ignorance and active resistance, leaving a soiled legacy for future generations. Our government's response to the climate crisis amounts to environmental blitzkrieg waged against those least capable of defending themselves, other species, the poor, and unborn generations. Although American citizens may not expect perfection from our political leaders, we do expect a level of stewardship greater than complete and utter incompetence. Unfortunately, US policymakers cannot clear this low bar on the urgent topic of climate. The Climate Change Performance Index compiled by the Climate Action Network ranks countries for their actions on climate change, including their climate policies, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions. Of the 60 countries measured, the United States and Saudi Arabia are 59th and 60th, respectively, on the list. As such, the effects of climate change continue to worsen. Leading organizations have become more urgent in their warnings. It makes you wonder, is there a worse crime? A worse crime than willfully and deliberately undermining organized life on this planet. And make no mistake, Every dollar that America invests in war today is not only a dollar not spent on addressing direct causes of climate change, but a reinvestment in more and worse wars in the future caused by climate change. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, quote, climate change sows seeds for conflict, but it also makes displacement much worse when it happens. 
In 2015, the DOD wrote a paper about climate-related security risks stating that it, quote, recognizes the reality of climate change and the significant risk it poses to U.S. interests globally. The report went on to note that the impacts are already occurring and projected to increase over time. Climate change will, quote, aggravate existing problems such as poverty, social tensions, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership, and weak political institutions that threaten domestic stability in a number of countries. The message that America needs to take away is that investing in climate change is an investment in national security. If unity can only be achieved by waging war, then let, let America have a war against global warming. It continues, and um, that was sort of something I wanted to talk about with other leaders um, from the military that could offer this unique perspective. And so I reached out to Colonel Wilkerson and Major General Leitch, um, asking them if they wanted to co-write a piece with me on this. And I wanted to get them on the byline as senior military officials who also have a perspective on this. And so we wrote that piece that was published in Yale Climate Connection uh, back in April. And the notion is that climate action groups have not been wildly effective at getting the sort of um, climate lukewarmers of the world worried or uh, concerned sufficiently relative to the amount of risk that we're facing. And I realized that when I talk about this with other people, and I talk about this in sort of the other peace action groups as well, a lot of groups want to focus on downstream policy solutions rather than just the upstream problem. And this is something we're working on at the Eisenhower Media Network. And what I mean by that is that a lot of people on the political spectrum can agree that the war in Afghanistan and Iraq have uh, been failed. They could agree that they've been extremely expensive, uh, you know, that they haven't produced any tangible results and that they're actually a net negative. The more we invest, the more is lost. Uh, but the problem is that once you go to the next step of where we might put that money instead, there's revolution because uh, lots of folks disagree. Some might say it should be tax cuts. Some others would say investment in something else, uh, government programs. And so if we start dividing our voice by going further and further to offering solutions rather than just agreeing on the problem at, and get majority voice on, on the problem, we can fight those second uh, policy battles later, but we can't even address them if we're doing it in a fragmented manner where everyone is suggesting different ideas for what should be done instead. We need to a group around the main problem uh, to, to go downstream. And I brainstormed this with Major General Leitch and, and Colonel Wilkerson. And I mean, my take on this is that climate change as an issue can be spun lots of different ways. You're uh, hurting your children and grandchildren. 50% uh, of vertebrate species and biodiversity loss will be extinct by the end of the century. Uh, you know, there will be more national or natural disasters and superstorms. Those things are maybe compelling to a certain group of people, but there is still a group of people that is resistant to, to accepting that climate change is real. It is happening. It's happening now, and it needs to be addressed um, more as seriously as a mobilization for World War II, effectively. And my uh, approach is to try to change the narrative around climate change in the military specifically. You can, it, there's no doubt, like we can talk about the military as being one of the leading polluters of the world. That's uncontroversial. There's plenty of data to, you know, point the finger at the military and wag it and say, you're very bad, you're a very large polluter, and the United States as a country is obviously cumulatively, and this was a point I was making in the book because yes, today uh, in, in 2022 figures, 
In absolute terms, China has more emissions than we do. But the thing that matters is the cumulative. Scientifically, cumulative matters because uh, carbon emissions are trapped in the atmosphere for thousands of years and they don't dissipate. So you, rather than measuring just this year, you want size under the curve of every year since the Industrial Revolution. And that's how you um, attribute um, responsibility and accountability. And the US is by far, by a country mile, the largest polluter. But when it comes to trying to activate that group, that resistant group that doesn't want to talk about uh, the climate crisis as a national security threat, we wanted to reframe it as it actually is extremely patriotic to take climate action. It is extremely patriotic um, to address this problem. And we do it in the sense of like, you're basically screwing the soldiers if you do not, because you do not want to try to provide national security in a three degree world. Providing national security in a three degree world would be far more expensive for the country. So again, removing all emotion, just talking in dollars and cents, it would be a lot harder to do it in, in a uh, three or four degree world. There would be more conflict. And if the US is uh, trying to be involved in these conflicts, there would be more of them and more uh, American children would be deployed for longer periods of time uh, to more unstable environments. And so maybe that is an argument that could resonate with folks. Uh, maybe a, an argument that it is a threat to our national security for physical bases. That if, if there's another climate book that came out uh, called When All Hell Breaks Loose, it came out in 2020 as well. And that was about climate change in the military. And they talk a lot about sort of the risks posed to military infrastructure. Um, and that would be sort of flooding of Air Force bases or naval bases, storms that would interrupt operations and service, all of these sorts of things. Uh, so basically sort of expanding on, on that point as well, that if you want to keep a strong America in terms of defense of the national territory, that it is good to invest in climate change because these are gonna affect our military preparedness. And so it's sort of taking a technocratic, like emotional appeal. So technocratic in the sense of like, this is affecting our, um, our, our uh, preparedness as a military and as a country to defend itself, but also the emotional appeal of if uh, in this world with greater warming, more American soldiers will be sent to war. Do we want that as a country? And so that was trying to flip the narrative um, and, and, and try to use that as a tool uh, to sort of help encourage people to think about climate change and, and militarism in a different way. So that's sort of the main point I wanted to get across with that article. Um, I'm trying to think, just quickly check if there's anything else that I wanted to capture. Yeah, I mean, basically, the one other quote that I had from my book, which summarizes some of my thinking, is that if the military is so myopic that it's only focusing on uh, combat uh, readiness and, and not climate change, and, and although they're sort of connected, it doesn't make much sense because how can you possibly keep the world safe for democracy or keep America safe in a more narrow ambit if you're not willing to do what is required to keep the world for safe for life on it? And that requires a, immediate action. And so that's the, that's the pitch. Happy to hear feedback from all of you. Uh, it looks like there's some comments in the chat. And I've been going for about a half hour. So let me pause uh, so I don't sound like a big windbag. Lonnie had a question, I think, and so did Fred. Um, Lonnie, I don't see, and John does too. Okay, let's do, um, Fred had a pretty straightforward one that about what a three degrees world is. Um, so, I mean, three degrees C is, is what we'd be referring to. So that would be three degrees centigrade. I don't know exactly what the uh, conversion is. It's probably like four point five or something like that Fahrenheit. Um, a three degree C world rise above industrial 
revolution, uh, industrial revolution temperatures. So it would be basically if we raise global temperatures on average by three degrees C, what would the world look like? And basically, I mean, I don't have uh, the, the full list of what those effects and implications are right in front of me, but it's effectively with each degree above two, uh, you, you get increasingly bad circles of hell, um, to, to be frank. So it is uh, about the extreme biodiversity loss where large uh, groups of species can become extinct. You can have issues as well, like there, there's a lot of wild effects when you when you study this about like trophic cascades, for instance. So one in in the food chain, one animal is particularly affected by uh, climate change and is wiped out. Well, that species fed the next species down, and so they don't have anything to eat because that species is gone. So they die out, and then the next one dies out, and then the next one dies out, and that's the trophic cascade uh, that's referred to. There's also like a, a lot of other wild um, nightmarish effects. Uh, if you think of sort of the thermohaline circulation of um, ocean currents. So you have hot and cold currents going around the, the globe that keep different geographies warmer or cooler. Uh, you know, for instance, if you melt down Greenland and you dump a bunch of cold, fresh water into uh, a current which is warm uh, going around England and, and parts of Europe, that it basically stops because you'll have cold on bottom and cold on top from the melting ice. And you basically disable the water from churning to create those uh, warm waters elsewhere. So you can create uh, you know, downstream effects um, elsewhere. It's also about sort of, uh, the volatility. So like not all parts of the world will experience climate change the same way. Uh, as I understand it, you know, like Caribbean countries uh, are going to be far less affected than the Nordics, for instance. So yes, when you talk about three degrees C, uh, you might be talking about nine degrees C in northern Sweden, uh, but something not much more than one degree maybe in the Caribbean. So it, it's spread out differently in different parts of the world. Um, then, then we've got um, Lonnie. Let me see if I can get you up on the screen to ask because you had actually the first question. Um, go ahead. Let me see if I can find you. Or just go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Well, what I was interested in is political action that you and others, uh, like <clears throat> the the uh, military folks that you wrote your article with in April. Are you taking any kind of political action? For example, I'm aware that the House in, in Congress has a group of representatives with military back, backgrounds that meet regularly. And I'm wondering if you've met with that group and tried to uh, persuade them of your perspective and see what you know kind of political action might come of it. Because it seems to me that there's got to be action at Congress. And you have a, a really persuasive story to tell. Uh, and there are plenty of people with military backgrounds in Congress. So it seems like an opportunity. Uh, okay, I've I, mean, got, just, just, I was just going to say I've got John and then Janet in the stack. Sorry, Eric, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, to, to answer your question, Lonnie, I mean, the short answer is no, I've not been invited by uh, any congressional groups to, to talk about the issue from a, a military and climate perspective. I know, I think the Colonel Wilkerson has been involved in different groups, and maybe it's just that they're more interested in more senior brass than a mid-level captain um, to be participating in these conversations. Uh, so I have not been on the Hill uh, to talk to people and try to push this this perspective um my angle is i occasionally write about it and and speak about it uh but but no haven't been involved in washington i see john Raby. yes ma'am eric first of all thanks for coming uh i have two short stories to tell you based on the observation that um, 
as a culture, the United States is very deeply military industrialized. And uh, my central question is, how do we decouple the public from its current military industrial mentality so that it can take effective political action to improve things? Now, here are the two incidents I'm gonna recite. Uh, I went to Stanford, which came east in 2013 to Mikey Stadium. Ah. Ah, so here we go. I thought you'd like that. Um, anyway, during the halftime show, a bunch of military industrial executives trotted out onto the football field and sprinkled among them were several West Point graduates who'd been senior officers. And they showed a video of military industrial equipment crushing every obstacle in sight. And then after the video was through, these guys turned to the Corps of Cadets and said quite openly, play your cards right. And at the end of your hitch, you could retire, join us, and get rich. The crowd loved it. Now let's fast forward to 2022. Top Gun Maverick, okay? Came out in the theaters in June. It's still packing them in. So I decided to see it, see how the message went, and see what the crowd reaction would be. Um, in its basic terms, the message is um, war is glorious, and when Americans fight it, it's always good. The point I'm trying to make it is that at the end of the film, the audience clapped and cheered. Now this strikes me as limbic stuff. And so my question is, what do we do about it? How can the peace movement change the popular culture and decouple that mentality so that uh, effective environmental and political action can follow? John, you're asking like the uh, the trillion dollar question. Uh, well, we've got to get there and deal with it, I'm afraid. No, I, I, I hear you. Um, I unfortunately will probably have a very unsatisfying series of answers uh, for that. I mean, it, I don't know how to do it. And I think that probably no one in this call knows how to do it, because if we did, it would have already have happened. Uh, gotcha. That, I mean, I, when I wrote the lead chapter of the, the book, Passive Descent, it, it, it is acknowledgement of collective failure of uh, that we've been speaking about this for a long time. You've been speaking about it even longer. Uh, and, and yet it's so difficult uh, to stop the Department of Defense budget from growing every single year by increments sometimes as large or larger than Russia's entire defense budget as a one-year incremental growth, uh, yeah. you know. So it, I, I think it's extremely challenging. I mean, like, I, I don't have any silver bullets. I mean, I, I'm hoping that, you know, there will be other uh, congressional representatives that have the courage to say, no, it, we need to cut this and rationalize what we're spending money on because it's not an effective use of, of cash. And I mean, from sort of a cold, emotionless numbers perspective, just, you know, articulating that this is not the threat that, you know, and I think America is slowly getting there that, re, you know, starting to realize that um, the Taliban boogeyman is a far smaller threat than climate change. So why are we spending $8 trillion fighting the Taliban boogeyman and spending, you know, tens of billions of dollars, you know, a small fraction uh, to address climate right. change. That there's the waiting, the magnitude of the waiting of spend is so hilariously, but tragically off that I, I think that people are slowly noticing this, but um, this isn't changing quickly. And I, I, I wish I had better answers other than continually trying to bang away in whatever way I can Mm -hmm. and appeal to as large an audience as possible. If I'm speaking to the progressive left, nobody gives a shit because that's, you know, a small, right. it's a, it's cool. Great. You're activating 10% of the voting base. <laughs> awesome. I mean, you need to activate more. So what is the argument that is going to hit moderates and hit uh, Republicans and, uh, you know, more centrist Democrats in a way that would change policy? And And I think that, that's why I'm trying to find arguments that work. And I'm hoping that 
uh, climate action as patriotism and putting the arguments forth is a positive message as opposed to a negative message, which is finger wagging that the military uses more petroleum than 140 countries on earth or whatever else. That doesn't move the needle, but saying that your children will go to more wars and we don't want to try to provide national security because it's so mm -hmm. much more costly might work. But um, I, I wish I had better answers, John. You ask a good question. Yes. Um, may I suggest something? Maybe we Please. need to demonstrate that we give a damn about working stiffs, like the guys you must have commanded. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because they're, they're a large slice of that 90% you're talking about. Mm. Great. That's a good question. Janet, you're up next. Um, let me okay. see if I can. Okay, so um, I want to somewhat uh, rephrase what I typed in the chat, um, Eric, but I am curious if you've read White Skin, Black Fuel, uh, which examines the, uh, the attachment of the right wing broadly construed both in Europe Brazil and the US, um, and I think has a lot of great insights in it, but um, you know, not, not sort of going that far to the right, but I think that understanding the appeal of, um, you know, everything from huge pickups to the idea of oil as underpinning both our national security and national identity um, might lead some it might give you some pathways into how to approach it with, as you're saying, this more, you know, not the liberal left, but the, you know, centrist to somewhat right wing. Um, and also, I'd just like to make a comment that as a military family member who desperately tried to talk my nephew out of going into the Marine officer bar, I understand, and you know it better than I do, the great appeal of the military and the actual tangible you know, benefits of the military. And I think on the left that we have denied that uh, in a way that has not served our causes. Yeah, I mean, I, I well, to answer your first question, Janet, I haven't read that book. Uh, to talk about the second comment, um, I think you're right. I think that um, almost everything is more complex and nuanced and to absolutely pan uh, military service, uh, you know, is not going to be something that will be well received by a lot of people um, that Maybe, I'm, I don't know if people crave for slightly more nuance than screaming on Fox News and, and screaming sometimes on MSNBC, uh, that the outrage mas machine is, is exhausting. So, you know, saying it's not all bad actually serving in the military, it really isn't. But, you know, here are the things that are positive. They can, let, let's have a look at those things. Which of these things can be acquired elsewhere? Can you acquire leadership skills? In, you know, in other professions? Can you have adventures with uh, other people doing rough and tumble things and lots of hiking and physical stuff to make you feel active and alive? You know, sure. Um, you know, are there ways to get health insurance that don't require you to go to war? Um, you know, and so like, there's a lot there. And um, I, I generally advocate that if you adopt a tone of informed consent, almost like a medical doctor, uh, saying like, here are the risks of undergoing this surgery, rather than saying like, no, don't do it, or absolutely do it, like more nuance around what that is. Uh, and and I, again, the, the hardest thing to convey, because it is, it doesn't fit in a bumper sticker, is like, Military service is entirely entwined with uh, what we're doing with the military, what missions we're sending them on. I have absolutely no problem. And, and like, maybe this is um, not with the ethos of some peace action groups, but I think that probably many believe in national security and defense of the homeland. I would have no problem going back to Boston um, 
and fighting an armed invader that's coming in on boats to take over America. Like, don't have a problem with war in the sense of defending a homeland against an aggressor, but that is not what we as a country do, and it is not what our military is trained to do um, anymore. We don't do missions protecting DC uh, as practice. It's always some faux Middle Eastern uh, you know, village that is erected in Louisiana, that it's an offensive mission, not a defensive mission. Um, so, I mean, basically, I went a little bit off the rails there, but uh, I, I, I hope that taking a tone of saying that there's actually some, some good to be had, that's okay. Um, but like here are the risks and, and they, don't, they don't outweigh the costs, or sorry, the benefits don't outweigh the costs. Great, thank you, Janet. Beth McCarthy is up next. Yes. You're in me. Great. I also have my cat oh. that just sat on my lap. So if you see a tail, um, it's not mine. <laughs> Go ahead, Beth. And then Lisa and then Tim next in that line. Oh, thank you. Um, I had typed my questions in and I think I got a few suggestions in the... Uh, um chat um, you also, just, sorry I'm, I'm only seeing oh no no now i see the, could yeah we i'm i'm not on video i'm on audio oh okay got it okay um i i, I got a few suggestions on the chat I, i'm basically interested in owner um not ownership i'm sorry um reading recommendations about you know the impact of arms development and manufacture and then of course the deployment on climate and environment um, because I just feel like there's a, are there any, uh, there must be analyses of the cost of this and the impact. And, you know, if you just look at the, you know, I'm interested in what there is to read to inform myself I don't, better. I don't read a ton of books on the military industrial complex. I, I read probably more news articles and, and uh, like newspaper articles. And then also like magazine features, you know, uh, the, the odd one that, you know, comes out in the Atlantic or the New Yorker or the Economist or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so generally, I think in that space, that's sort of what I've been reading. Um, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of other stuff that has larger narrative arcs about the role of military. I mean, Rachel Maddow's Drift, and for instance, sort of talks about that as well. Uh, but I would say mostly for military industrial complex issues, I, again, I probably read mostly news. Um, when it comes to climate change in the military, all hell breaking loose is probably the most recent and all encompassing uh, book that like tackles that, that angle. Um, it's honestly not the most exciting read to, to, to be real with you, that's, that's my perspective. And it's probably a lot of stuff that you have already had in your gut as knowing was true, but is elaborated quite a lot. Like, you know, for instance, uh, as we talked about sort of cost to decarbonize the American military, uh, impairments to military readiness due to extreme weather, flooding and storms, uh, increased costs associated with having to do more military operations because of food scarcity in other countries that then breaks out in civil war. Uh, and so it, it sort of explores all of those uh, ways in which defense and climate overlap. Uh, but that's probably the, the best one I've found in that space. Great. Um... Lisa has a question that she actually mentions Andrew Basevich, who is the editor of the Paths of Defense that you wrote the first lead chapter on. Lisa, can you unmute? I, I would rather not, but if you insist, yes. Um, I referenced Andrew Basevich's writings on um, not just the wasted military expenditures in Afghanistan, but in the two military actions in Iraq and in Bosnia and, and, and basically 
he poses our wasted military expenditures since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, long before you were born. Um, Not long. Uh, I was born in 85. <laughs> Great. So, um, so I'm wondering if you're familiar with his writings and whether, uh, you know, I know that the that the military has been, as you mentioned, you know, preparing for, you know, strategies with regard to defensive approaches towards um, climate catastrophes and climate migration and et cetera, and climate refugees and, and all of that. Is there anything happening internal to the military where people are saying, hey, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Like we can be more effective being proactive rather than being reactive here. So I, I, there's, I think widespread acknowledgement in the military based on what I've been reading. I mean, I, I left the military in 2012. So I'm not party to how Brass talks about the topic day to day now. Uh, I mean, what I read from uh, the Department of Defense when they publish reports, you know, it's apropos that you asked, because I, before this, I did a quick search to find out what the Department of Defense is saying. And here's the quote. Uh, this is published, DOD preparing for climate change impacts, officials say, June 15th, 2022, by uh, a guy from DOD News. So you know, insider. And, quote, climate change is dramatically increasing the demand for military operations and at the same time impacting our readiness and our ability to meet those demands while imposing unsustainable costs on the department, he said. To me, it, like, whenever I read anything about this, in the stages of action, the military is at stage awareness. Like, there is a, a awareness and they've gone to acknowledgement. So it's not like, oh, climate change is an issue. Uh, they've, they've proceeded at least to climate change is an issue and it's totally gonna hit us pretty hard. I think in terms of like further downstream stages of like, and then spend a disproportionate amount of our budget actually uh, refitting bases, decarbonizing our vehicle. <clears throat> I, I don't, I, the military is a really slow moving thing. And if I were a military industrial complex executive, um, they have a perfect entry to spend you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, for the future because they'll say, we at Boeing and Lockheed Martin care about the environment. And that's why we are proposing a new fleet of vehicles replacing the entire military fleet of vehicles that exist today, which are lower carbon. So please, buy these instead. And that I would imagine is going to be um, the military's social impact approach uh, to trying to address their own emissions in, in, internally. So obviously you can retrofit buildings, you can do microgrids uh, to increase uh, basically like protection for the base in the sense that like if a large storm were to wipe out the grid the microgrid uh, with solar panels and whatever else could create energy locally so that they would be insulated with battery storage and, and generation capacity to run the base basically without the grid. So there'll probably be billions of dollars spent buying a lot of microgrid and solar stuff so that when increasing numbers of natural disasters happen, the military bases still operate. That's not still not helpful for like the world in terms of uh, <laughs> like, they don't have an answer for how they can possibly do five times as many military conflicts per annum because climate change is creating civil war everywhere and food scarcity happens or water scarcity happens. I think that they're just completely unprepared for climate change is my, my perspective in reading these quotes. They know it's a thing. They know it's going to hit them. They know they need to spend more money doing stuff. But the size of the tidal wave that's going to hit the military in terms of um, how much damage climate change will do in terms of military preparedness is like a tsunami. And so it's like, great, you're building sandcastles, you're building some local small walls to sort of protect the military, but that's not fixing the underlying issue. So, I mean, the government needs to do broader stuff uh, and that gets into a larger discussion about carbon taxes and whatever else, but um, I won't go down that. 
Tim, Rosalie, and Glenn in the lineup. Go ahead, Tim. You're unmuted. Hi, Eric. Um, I'm a former combat arms officer also. Um, I, I'm interested. So I, I'm looking forward to reading your book, but are you looking at I mean, obviously, foreign policy is the best way we can change the impact uh, of our military on climate change, right? Um, and so are you focused more there or are you focused more on internally to the military what they can do and what's within their control um, in, in changing it or is it, is it both focuses? And I guess, um, it, within the military, I, 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 it, what's the biggest uh, area? I mean, besides our foreign policy, <laughs> is is it is it the manufacturing of all the equipment, um, or is it uh, or is it operations that is the biggest contributor? Uh, it's a good question. I can answer the second one first, which is I don't actually have the sort of high chart of um, uh, effectively allocating emissions by type for um, the military. So I, I'm not entirely sure whether it's the manufacturing of aircraft versus base operations in foreign countries. I would imagine that like permanent bases in lots of different countries is, is a larger footprint than um, many of the others. Uh, because we're in something like, what is it, 80 odd countries? I think more than that. I'd have to look at, there's a Smithsonian Magazine article that, that talks about that. Um, so I'm not entirely sure in terms of how to do allocation off the top of my head. Uh, it, for your first question about like what I'm focused on, it, it's, it's both. I mean, the US as a country has a lot of work to do in terms of addressing its uh, carbon footprint. And historically, the burden that America as a country has placed on the rest of the world proportionately for all of the emissions that are in the atmosphere today overwhelmingly falls on the shoulders of Americans. We've, we've burned more and created more um, and, and have therefore a larger share of responsibility for the climate crisis than other countries because we were responsible for it. Uh, so I think that like addressing America at, at large and what we can do about it is is more important than addressing the next level down, which is the military, which is also a very large emitter and you know the largest consumer of petroleum. It's one of the largest emitters globally, more than like you know domestic um, emissions for Exxon Mobil uh, and, and things like that. There's umpteen examples of how. The military uh, uses a, a tremendous amount of, of resources and, and burns a lot. So there's obviously both. And the military needs to figure out how they're going to reduce emissions. As you uh, rightly called out, one of the best ways is to have fewer wars and to have fewer bases in foreign countries. But the real issue, again, is upstream. How can we address America as a country's um, emissions? And what are we going to do about it? Great. Um, I'm looking for Rosalie. She had a comment in the chat, but I don't see her here. So the next question is, Glenn, are you unmuted? There you are. Still not unmuted. Yes. My question really stems from uh, a meeting with Buckminster Fuller about 40 years ago uh, when he wrote his book, Critical Path. And his uh, basic premise was that we need to maintain terrestrial ecological integrity. While we're all dealing with the energy crisis, we're forgetting the most important and most significant aspect of all of it, which is the degradation of life in the biosphere. We're not paying attention or measuring any of this criteria. We're simply trying to maintain our lifestyles best we can. Does it make sense, uh, in addition to your premise, uh, uh, Eric, uh, about patriotism, 
and I'm a former combat veteran, so I've been working this agenda for at least 40 years uh, to try and change the social context with reward. And the reward must be economic and also social in its context. Uh, a way to decouple uh, the worst part of a war culture is to create a, an additional culture that equals in all ways the nobility and the pride that we now focus in our war culture. Understood. Um, I mean, I, one one thing to your comment, Glenn, I, I just pasted it in the chat. Uh, and I, I don't know how seriously the White House is, is taking this, but other measures aside from strictly gross domestic product, um, you know, is, is this notion, uh, and this is something that was talked about when I was at grad school in Oxford a decade ago, uh, but like the basically the natural capital, and it's to say like, you know, trees, water, everything else that we exist on that underpins existence as humankind has value. We should try to do our best to measure that and ensure that are the, each of those different sort of things that under the natural assets, are they growing or shrinking? And how much is climate change affecting each of those? Uh, and, and trying to basically create another uh, index of well-being and health, in addition to just pure um, externality denying GDP. Okay, I think we've reached the top of the hour. We had one quick question from Chuck Charles Spanger. Are you? Do you have a quick question? Uh, yes. Um, do you? Uh, what do you, who do you, what organizations, veteran organizations do you think are doing good climate work now and what would that work be? That's a good question. Um, I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, I, um, I, I, I don't, operate in the sort of veterans climate space day to day. I, I write articles and, and books and stuff um, and I, I speak about it, but I'm not, I'm not as aware of which 501c3 organizations um, are, are doing more or less formal or informal groups are, are really taking this seriously. I mean, um, Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer, honestly. I mean, like I, I belong to About Face, which you know, sort of is it talks about um, so veterans against the war and the aspects of climate. But I mean, there's lots of other sort of more think tanky and academic groups. Uh, Basevich's Quincy Institute writes a lot of white papers and sort of more academic type work, which gets quoted by things like the Washington Post. So their impact and their role is is slightly different. Some take more like grassroots organizing approach to trying to share the message. Others try to influence the sort of uh, the, the media to share that perspective. But I don't have a particularly good view on, on who's best these days. And just a quick, um, Janet, do you have something to say about Veterans for Peace campaign or? Well, I am discouraged that Eric has not mentioned Veterans for Peace. Veterans for Peace, of course, the yeah. project. We um, have presented our slideshow, which we continually update, by the way. Um, we presented that to now over 80 groups within the last eight and a half, I mean, 18 months. We have a deep website. We are um, doing these stop the war, save the climate street actions. We're doing a lot, um, okay. webinars and so on. So Great, thank you, Janet. Yeah, and, and Janet, obviously I've, I've talked at um, Veterans for Peace groups in the past. Are there other groups that you're thinking about as well, Janet? Because when I think about the space, you know, there's a lot of different folks trying to uh to work on the issue and and to talk about it um i i don't have some sort of rank order on who's 
most effective in, in generating change on, on, on the discussion? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that it would be great to get some kind of, um, you know, conference of veterans organizations and get more post 9-11 veterans such as yourself involved. But uh, I would say in terms of sustained ongoing public engagement, um, Veterans for Peace is, um, we're the ones doing it for right now. Um, and uh, I'm really hoping that at some point we can get veterans testifying to the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis which is a committee that not a lot of people seem to even know exists, but really is important for shaping the discourse um, around the military greenwashing and other things that you have mentioned. Great, okay, so I promised Eric that he had he gets off at eight o'clock and we've got five minutes over. Do you have any last minute comments before we close? Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, Janet, if you ever get that to happen where you've successfully um, negotiated to have veterans testify, Keep me on the list, please. I would love oh, you would be, you would definitely be at the top of the list. So um, thank and, and, you. And I apologize for being remiss in, in mentioning Veterans for Peace straight away. <laughs> no. no worries. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Eric, for joining with us and, and sharing your thoughts. Thank and you. I hope everyone, um, yes, if we can all kind of unmute and say thank you and, and wave or Clap your hands or congratulate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank you so much. I took notes. Thank I'm going to share them. Thank you. Thank you. Well thank you so much. I'm really grateful that I was able to spend some time with all of you.